hi good afternoon everyone uh it's such a it's a pleasure to join on uh, the conference uh, the first one that's being held here and i look forward to having a good dialogue so maybe uh, i thought we'll what we'll do is spend 15 minutes just sharing some of the things that we are doing in dbs around the whole data and analytics space for us uh, our ambition is to really be a data driven bank in some cases we have started to now use the thinking that how can we be an ai fueled bank and each and every part of the bank has ai fueling or driving its success in the future so that that's our ambition uh, we are we have a long way to go but that's what we are aspiring for so i'm excited to share some some context around that uh, with everyone here um if you move to the next slide as we as we started off the whole journey our focus was really on making sure that we are driving value and value for our employees value for our customers value for our stakeholders from data and and within that context we had four pillars of driving that value uh, one was really around the whole analytics capability so really setting up the analytics center of excellence building the deep expertise around data scientists and and all those things around that but that's one part of that second is culture and curriculum and there are two elements to it one is continuously upskilling people within the bank and also as we hire both universities graduates and others how do we keep upskilling and make sure people keep up with the uh, fast paced moving times and expertise that's happening the, the within the, this culture there's also an element of making sure that we are training everyone including our leaders in the bank to say how can they leverage um and change the way they operate their business with data and ai because that's a significant upskilling it's not just about having the smart data scientists having a few models if you really want to change a large multinational organization with multi product you need to make sure that you are embedding it across every decision that's being done so that's really where leadership training and culture change comes in third around the whole enable data use which is really about in a bank typically data was all about being locked down about risk control about making sure that we there's no way we we have access to wrong data and stuff so how do we balance making sure that we continue to have the right data to the right people at the right time with the right risk associated with it or, or controls associated with the fourth really is it really making sure that we have a fit for purpose advanced um, uh, tooling technology platform that we can continue to build on which leverages both hybrid multi, uh, on prem cloud and also public cloud so for us all four of these pillars working simultaneously when we started of the journey were a critical aspect as we did about it so just this level sets the context in terms of how how we have been approaching it our ambition around the whole data being a data driven organization or ai fueled organization if we move to the next page and i'm shifting gears a little given that we were going to talk about trust and we were um, and so really as we have been looking to institutionalize ai uh, at scale in various parts of the bank what are some of the challenges that we are finding and how do we think around that one is um competitive disadvantage and i think this is both cultural and otherwise compared to technology firms just being in a bank being a, where we hold people's money there is a significant amount of focus on our trust on responsible use and therefore sometimes we are much more conservative in terms of how we approach especially when we do experimentation compared to maybe we are a bit slower compared to a tech firm because we are more considered about it but to me it it is i think table stakes going forward to be considered um as more and more ai ml applications come in oh, there is complexity in a banking environment because we are a multi product environment it's very different to a single product uh, and and therefore a customer holding multiple products multiple dealings with the bank how, and therefore the ai solutions become quite complex and how do we make sure we can string them at scale and bring them together talent continues to be a big challenge the demand supply mismatch on talent is really is is there is continues to grow but how do we work with both universities our partners to continue to upskill and get higher and then train people uh, the one of the other uh, issues that have come up over the past few years is been really the regulators have started to look at um, 
AI governance, but there's been a very different divergence in terms of different perspectives when they think about AI and model governance. It's how do we, we are governed by uh, by MAS, our financial regulator. We are governed by our regulators in each of the countries we operate. We are governed by the Singapore PDPC. And how do we make sure that all these differing governance models are something that we can efficiently work with uh, and not just stifle uh, experimentation? And then the last two, for us, everything is really about making sure that we are building and maintaining trust. Um, and our approach has been towards incremental rather than big bank, because we don't think in this fast evolving space, big bank would be a waste of money. We don't know what big bank we should work towards. So we are continuously building iteratively. So these are some of the things as we look to institutionalize and really drive AI. If we move to the next page, I'll go a bit more a detail in terms of uh, how we think about responsible use. This is something that, you know, three, four years ago, before responsible use of data was, was very fashionable, we had already started working on our approach, our framework for it. So we, we're actually quite proud of the fact that we are very focused on building trust in our responsible use of data. Now, this has three elements to it. The first one is really all about the data in DBS, and it's really, can we use the data? So it's really about the legal aspects of it. But so this is really the table stakes. You, you, you need to have the right uh, legal needs and all of that sorted to really even say data that I have in DBS, can I use the data? So that's our foundation layer. But that by itself is not enough. The next question to ask is, should we use the data? Really, the, based on all the use cases that we are doing, is that and how should we? And therefore, we came up with our own framework, which we call PURE. And I will go through it with you in the next few pages, uh, which is really about how for every data use case and AI model use case, we are using a pure thinking or pure approach. The last but not the least is really about how we use the data. As we use more and more AI models, which have become more and more black boxes uh, with algorithms going in, how do we use it? And therefore, how do we make sure that the models are governed appropriately? So that's kind of our approach, it's not just about legally can we use it, but it's really about should we use it and how we use it. So very important for us that the focus around all three aspects uh, in terms of how we use data. As we move, can you move to the next page? Some of the things that we have, um, which have worked for us as we have thought about this responsible use framework is really what are our guiding principles? What drives? So one is really for us, primary focus on individual data relating to individuals in terms of making sure that we get that right because that's whether the individual is our employee or our customer so getting that right uh, broad consent uh, as a foundation it's very difficult uh, nowadays in this world uh, to have get very specific consent all the time and give you an example we have cameras uh, outside our branches if somebody is walking past that image is captured now can we get consent from that person to say, yeah, we are capturing your image? Probably not possible for in a high traffic uh, environment. So, how do, so therefore, how do we work with that? Um, legal and regulatory uh, frameworks are evolving. So continuously, the requirements keep changing. So making sure that we are meeting them and are on top of and in some cases, working with the regulators to help shape that also. Um, the one important aspect, which is really about that we we are very use case focused. So don't do governance or responsible use for the sake of it, but be specific on any use case, which is when we are actually using the data or the algorithm to deliver something to our customer or employee. And therefore, at that for that use case, make sure we are responsible in our use of data. We One of the things we are always trying to trade off and always manage is balances really between um, the whole time to market how can we be speedier, but at the same time manage the risk? And that's always the trade-off, and especially for a regulated entity like a bank. Uh, the other two aspects, all of this that we do is really to make sure that we are enhancing, preserving, and growing the trust that customers have in DBS as a brand. And, there, and we continue to grow that as we start using a more and more AI in how we enhance and deliver more value to our customers. So very critical in terms of our thinking and our approach to, uh, to doing uh, responsible use. Uh, moving to the next page. So we, I, like I said, I was, we are very proud of this framework that we came up and it's quite simple, it's pure. And 
what does it stand for? So P is really purpose. So every data use case should have a purpose. Why are we doing it? What is the purpose of doing it? The purpose could be to the customer, to the employee, to society, to social, to stakeholders. But be very clear, state the purpose and make sure that the purpose is appropriate to the use of the data and the kind of data we're using. U is really about that it should be unsurprising to a individual for which you're using the data. So, you, so a normal individual, uh, it should be unsurprising. It should not come as a wow, shock that, oh, why are they using the data for that perspective? So it should, how do we make that unsurprising or how do we think of that? R is our approach to them should be respectful. So we are respectful in terms of how we use the data, how we communicate to customers, and, and that comes across uh, in all our communications that are there. Um, last is E, which is really about that we should be explainable, explainable to our own employees, explainable to the customers, explainable to people who we are using it to say, how does this explainability come into the picture so that we can make sure that what models we are using, what how we are using the data, the use case, is something that can be explained to a normal person. So that's kind of every use case in DBS. Um, there's a lot more detail behind each of these elements, uh, but every use case in DBS actually goes through a pure a pure framework to before we actually um, uh, launch it or go live. Um, moving to the next page. Um, as uh, So this is something we've been evolving. We first set up, we've already established the pure uh, framework two, two and a half years ago. We are evolving the approach to AI and model governance. And, ob and obviously it is a, it is a tightrope and it's a balancing act between how do we make sure that we manage the material risk for material things, uh, but also uh, what is the governance effort? So for example, if it's a marketing campaign with uh, with let's say 1% response rate and you're using models to improve it by 50%, but it still is 1.5%. How do we make sure that the model governance effort is not so, so big that it kind of reduces our ability to be nimble and our ability to really execute and, and get to market fast? So that's always the, the trade-off and the rings that we are working to make sure we do. Now, just summing all of this up, and if you move to the next page, uh, the ML code per se is actually a very small part of the ML uh, lifecycle system. So if you move to the next page, the ML lifecycle system is actually consists of all these elements from configuration data and the ML code or just the M model is actually a tiny fraction of this whole piece. And, and this is uh, actually a Google paper on hidden technical debt. Uh, it's one of the better papers and it's still relevant today even though it's quite old, but something. But even this ML life system is not enough. If you move to the next page, because the way we have to solve it, we have to really solve the business problems. We have to industrialize the ability to solve multiple business problems very fast and do that. And that's where the ML system comes in in the middle. But that is not enough because every system, we need to make sure that we do change management, both for the customers with our employees to make sure that the actions that are being recommended and being done actually deliver results. And, and for us, it is all about enhancing trust in the end-to-end -end process, not just about the model build, but the end-to-end -end from the problem uh, to the action and the feedback. So that's where, that's how our, we approach. We are, we are quite uh, happy with the progress that we have made. We continue to keep focused on making sure that we are very focused on uh, working towards being an AI fueled bank using AI in every part of the bank and at the same time uh, making sure that we are enhancing building on the trust that customers have with the bank. So that, that's kind of uh, my presentation. Uh, I thought that would be a good segue uh, for more questions coming in um, as we think through. So thank you. Hey, Samia, thank you very much for your sharing. And thank you so much for, I think, your very interesting insights, especially to how DBS is um, kind of really going along on this ML journey. So we, we do have some time for some questions from the audience. Um, the first question we have is, do you think it's important to educate the customer about how their data has been used? Especially tying in with the example that you had regarding the yeah. um, CCTV, right? How important um, is it? Yeah, it is. It is important. But and I think it's important and it's a right, right balancing act to educate customers. But again, uh, the way we are thinking about it, that it is important to educate con customers in a context. You can't. And it is in the context of a use case. 
and in a, and give people choices. So one of the things we have done is uh, we we have something called intelligent nudges, where we look at okay if, if and that's really based on uh, rules and AI. So if you've been paying an Apple uh, subscription every month for two dollars at a particular date. And we, we know that that's been going on next month before it's coming up, we'll remind you. Or suddenly, if it becomes from $2 to $4, we'll say, but we ask customers that, do you want to do this? Do, would you like us to do it? And this is what you would get so that it gives them the ability to sign on as well or to say, yes, I am interested. But in context of a use case, you have to educate customers. You have to make sure that they and you have to make sure they see the value they're getting because it's a value driven thing. If they get value, they will use you and they will use these insights more. If they don't get value, they will feel that it's it's uh, you're being creepy. OK, I see. Um, so in terms of trust, then, do you say that trust is um, a bit more contextualized um, in terms of building trust in your models? Like you mentioned, end to end trust, both with the custom customers as well as the users of the model. I, I think them probably trust has money layers. There is a base level trust. So you're making sure you're doing all the right things legally and all of that, and you're you're being uh, transparent and all that. Then there is these elements of when you use it, especially in this AI context, uh, there is a, I think all of us are uh, in some ways hypocrites. And I, I will say that. the reason why I say that, I and I'll give my example. I am paranoid about my data, but I use Google Maps, right? I, it's free. But it has access to, I mean, it, it has everything that, you know, but I use it. So but why? I, but when it comes to some other company, maybe I'll say, no, sorry, I'm very paranoid. I won't give you my data and I won't, I want to see. So, so we are very, con on a context based, we are paranoid. We are not just, because the reason I use Google map is because I get value from it. So for, for uh, any enterprise and even for us as a bank, we have to provide value to the customer. If the value is sufficient, and is of uh, the customer feel yes this is a value then they will be feeling yes both the trust and they will feel this is useful for me okay that makes sense that's very that's very um, well explained answer so i think we have time for one last question can you give a uh, maybe short example of a success story of impact from machine learning and improving businesses in dps uh, but we have many examples. We, we actually uh, quite uh, we track around it. So we, we've had examples in our consumer business where we have looked at intelligent nudges for our wealth customers, but going to the RMs, what would make sense? And it's not just about selling. It's just that if you have a holding uh, and you are over indexed in a Forex, the Forex moves in a certain way, just giving insights to people and that in turn has led to so we we did a test test and control people who get uh, insights and are regular are actually do a lot more business with the bank so people who find it they get useful insight that is helpful for them not just selling products uh, they actually do much more with the bank um, that's just one example we do it across the board in our in our uh, uh, SME business where we are looking at nudges and next breast action for our SME customers. Uh, we look to use um, uh, AI in our call, call center to predict when customers go to call us. So can, maybe can we proactively reach out? So we've, we've, we use actually AI. We have more than 150 odd use cases of which are AI driven, which are running across the bank. So quite extensive around that. One last, I guess, short quiz. If you were to say like which part of the bank has benefited the most from AI or ML, which would you, in your personal opinion, which would you say? Well, I, I think, I mean, that's driven by uh, two things. One is our consumer bank has the largest number of customers and also therefore the largest number of data points, right? So therefore, where there is a large customer base and there's a large set of data and available, that's where AI probably uh, is most beneficial. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you so much again for your time. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll hand the time back now to Tran, who will introduce our next speakers. Thank you very much, Samir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samir, and thank you all for your participation and questions.